see the time down there. Are we? Good morning. Another fine day, and there's folks still coming in, so might have got one or two items to draw your attention to. Um, first of all, uh, thank you to Douglas and William and David uh, for last week's service. So I can I can now record this sermon uh, from the man's possibly, and uh, it will. I mean, I get a long lie on a Sunday morning. That's great. Um, anyway, thank you for that. That was that was lovely. Um, the seed sowers meet on Wednesday afternoon, as usual, in the church hall. Bible study resumes on Wednesday evening at 7.30 in the church lounge. We are in Genesis chapter 6. Also, just, uh, just for your... Just to let you know, I have the school assembly, the harvest assembly, so it must be school holiday time coming up, uh, fast approaching uh, this coming Friday uh, afternoon. Also, our harvest supper this year will be on Friday the 18th of October with the harvest service on the Sunday following, so the 20th for harvest. Our final history group outing, uh, this year's final history group outing, will be on Tuesday the 22nd of October. We're going to visit St. Joseph's Church in uh, Dundee. Uh, it's a Catholic church. We've never been in an actual active worshipping Catholic church, so it'll be very interesting to see uh, the differences as well as the similarities. I've often spoken about these things when we've visited places of worship. Worship. So it'll be great. It's a, their 150th anniversary, so we'll get something of the history uh, of the church. I myself will be sharing um, a little of the history of the church, the Catholic Church in particular, from the Reformation on until it was legal again to, to organize and to worship uh, as churches that were recognized in our nation. So we'll be looking at these things. It'll be a good day. Um, we're also after lunch. So we'll do our usual. We've got to, we're going to run a bus from the church. There's a sheet on the communion table. If you would like to join us, I urge you to do so. It'll be another great day. Um, we'll leave. I'm not entirely sure what time we're going to leave. I'm going to, I was going to give a time, but I'm not really 100% sure. I will confirm, but I think around about 10 o'clock. We'll start as usual, 11.30. We'll have our lunch there. We'll have a time of worship, discussion, look at the history, look at the building and so on. And after lunch, we're going to go to the McManus Museum. And again, we will look at the, consider the history, uh, the rich, particularly the ecclesiastical history, Christian history, our heritage uh, relating to Dundee at the McManus um, Museum in the afternoon before we return home. And what will happen, you see, the bus will take us to St. Joseph's, the bus will pick us up from there, take us to the McManus Museum, and then we'll pick us up there afterwards and bring us uh, back home again. So you don't need to worry about long walks uh, in between the two locations. That's the goal. So names, uh, please, on the, on the sheet so we have a, an idea of the numbers that we'll be attending. Also, the, I'm going to say a wee bit more about the Blythewood Shoebox Appeal uh, in a few moments. I forgot, I forgot to look. But I better look. The next guild meeting will be on Tuesday the 8th when Heather Kelly will be here to either demonstrate, show, or is she bringing along handmade chocolates? So that's good. So keep some for Sunday, please. Uh, that'll be ideal. Is that all the intimations? Just one final thing, because I, I suspect one or two folks have been asking about David Meals. And obviously, David's not going to be with us much longer. Um, David's dying, and uh, he longs to be with the Lord and to be reunited with Sylvia. Um, so our th thoughts and prayers uh, are with David, and um, I will let you know um, once David has uh, passed out of this life and entered into the presence of our God, um, when uh, what the funeral arrangements uh, will be. But we remember David, he's in White Hills uh, in Forfar. He's very comfortable and he's, uh, you know, he's talking 
um, but it's, it's only a matter of time. I think these are all the intimations. Is there anything I've forgotten? Okay, let us worship our God. Let us sing to his praise, and we do so. It's, it's not Psalm anything. It's hymn 120, if you're using the church hymnal, but the words will appear uh, with a video on the screen. God, we praise you. God, we bless you. Let us come before our God in prayer. Let us bow our heads. O Lord, our God, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather together to lift up your name, to praise you, the living God, who is our living hope. We thank you that you are with us and that you are for us through your Son, Jesus Christ, who promises to be in our midst. And we ask, O oh God, that we might behold him, that we would come to know the love of the Father through the person and work and revelation of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your abiding presence with us and your goodness to us. 
we thank you and can say great is your faithfulness for you are the God who fulfills your covenant promises uh, to your church. We thank you that you have called us into this unique and special relationship to yourself whereby we have received the spirit which enables us to say together, Abba, Father, for we have come to know the richness, the unfathomable, unfathomable nature of your awesome love for us. We thank you, our God, that we worship one God and three glorious persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May we come today like Samuel of old, uh, willing to say, speak, Lord, for your servant heareth. May we come like Mary, the mother, the blessed virgin, the, the mother of our Lord, and say, let it be to me according to your word. May our spirits rejoice in God, our Savior. Enable us as we come into your presence to come humbly, but to come hopefully, to come boldly to the throne of grace, understanding that we are accepted in the beloved and we have access to the riches of your grace day and night at all times. But we thank you in particular that we can gather as your church in this location. We come together as your beloved children, called to walk before you in love. So be with us to bless us and to encourage us. Meet with us and meet our needs, for we know, Lord, that all things are known to you. You are the God who is truly all-knowing and all-seeing, who is all-wise and all-caring. Lord, a bruised reed you will not break, a smoldering wick you will not snuff out. We thank you that we can come with all our cares, with all our burdens, and cast them upon you because we know that you care for us. Lord, as we come, we come asking once again that you would show us mercy, that you would forgive us our many sins. O oh Lord, we come to Calvary. We come to the cross where Jesus was made sin uh, for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for the absolution that we have found in Jesus. We thank you for your promise that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And so, Lord, we do. We take a moment just to ask your forgiveness that we might be truly restored to, your, uh, to, to fellowship with you. It's not that you turn away from us. But at times, Lord, we forget you. We turn our backs upon you. We go our way rather than your way. Help us to recognize and ask for the old paths, wherein is the good way, the way of peace and pleasantness. Hence, grant us that peace that surpasses all understanding, that peace that Jesus himself bestows upon us when he says, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives to you, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Bless us and be with those absent loved ones, be especially with those who are sick, be with those who are, who are dying, be with those who are bereaved. We commit and commend them to your love and to your care, to your comfort and to your support. For we recognize that underneath are the everlasting arms that our God has gone to prepare a place for us. But Lord, we know that nothing and no one uh, is taken from this world without our God. Um, and hence we recognize that you are the God who appoints a time for our entry into this world and another for our departure from it. May we be able to say the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of our God who works all things for the good of those who love him. So bless and be with us and comfort us uh, with these thoughts. Lord, there are so many things that we cannot understand in the here and now. We cannot understand the, when we look out on the world why it is that there is so much hatred and violence and wickedness, corruption. And yet, O oh Lord, your word shows us why it is so, but we long for that day 
when peace and for love and for joy to be reestablished in our world. We long for the new heavens and new earth in which will reign righteousness, when harmony and happiness will indeed cover the earth like the glory of our God. So bless and enable us, O Lord, to look up and work for our common good, to work for the advancement of your kingdom of love here and elsewhere, to do all things with a view to setting up the name of Jesus Christ, that name before whom every knee will bow and every tongue confess in the fullness of time. So be with us, so bless us, so forgive us and renew us. Revive your church, O Lord. Um, continue to minister to us through word and through sacrament, through our fellowship and through our prayers. In Jesus' name, who taught us to say together, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Ever. Amen. Well, we're going to we're going to uh, watch together uh, this year's Blythswood um, video appeal, the shoebox appeal, and then I'll say a few words uh, afterwards. Reaching the isolated, remembering those forgotten. Shining light in the darkness, providing warmth in the cold, a message of hope. You give more than a shoebox. My name is Jeremy Ross and I'm the Chief Executive of Blycewood and it's been my privilege to be delivering the shoeboxes. As we give the shoeboxes out in different parts of Eastern Europe, there are so many partners who are motivated to help the people in their own community to find perhaps the poorest, the neediest and to go and give gifts to them. We've got lots of partners in Ukraine who've been moved to help the people who've moved from other parts of Ukraine when the land has become occupied. We've met people who've lost their fathers, their husbands and people who've lost their homes and to be able to give them a box and to be alongside the people who've got to know them and gone into their situations to help them has been really great. Today we are with one of our partners in Ukraine, the Ushgorod Baptist Church and the House of Mercy. Since the breakout of the, the war, they've been working with refugees from all over the Ukraine. They have been helping over 4,000 people. Even today, as we speak, they're housing more than 60 people on this location in mobile homes and 200 lunches are being served every day for refugees, for people in need who have no other means of living. So we are at Rakoshina. Old people home. Uh, today we have 17 uh, old and alone people who live here. And uh, House of Mercy uh, took over this place uh, almost uh, five years ago. So these are people who have no nobody. And uh, the need for places like this is huge actually uh, in our area. Too many people who have no, no place to go when they are old and alone. And uh, um, yeah, many of them find shelter here. The Roma camp in the place called Pirohova. The Roma camp is built in the former uh, garbage place of the city, actually. We found it in a, in a really terrible condition when we first came there like uh, 10, 12 years ago. We brought uh, many trucks with garbage out of it and uh, many houses have been fixed or repaired. Uh, people have it a little bit better than before. Still, as you can see, it's a really poor place uh, to live in and uh, we give uh, regular hot food to children there. We give them food, food packages, we give them medicines uh, they need, help them with uh, the drinking water, with uh, bread and many, many other things.
We are at Sarata. This is a small village near Cluj. Here we have six families we help. And uh, we came now with shoeboxes here. This kind of uh, presents are uh, very nice. And it's very important for these people because they don't get nice presents. Children are happy just to see <laughs> the shoeboxes. And um, I think it's a help for parents because uh, they don't have money to buy presents. And then children get present this is a big difference for me it's important to visit these families to visit these people just to tell them that there is somebody who loves us and we can love them as well alongside the practical gifts Blythwood care packs christian literature in every shoebox with messages of hope for children and adults one of the things that people say to those of us who are delivering shoeboxes is thank you for remembering us and I think that's one of the main messages that I want to give back to the people who fill the shoebox and who've made it possible to get them out here. Thank you for remembering people who feel that they've perhaps got nobody to give them Christmas gifts anymore. You see lots of different reactions when a child opens their shoebox, whether it's the ball that they can immediately start playing with or the book that they start leafing through. We even saw a child get excited a few moments ago when he opened his box and found some toothpaste. I'd love more and more people to fill shoe boxes because what we're finding across Eastern Europe is that we could really give more shoe boxes to more people in need. So if you're able to fill a shoe box, ask your friends and family to fill a shoe box, that would be great because they really do make a difference and are appreciated by people who often have very little or have no one else who's able to give them a gift. We really appreciate it, but not as much as the people that we're able to hand the boxes to. Thank you. Well, you will see on the screen, these are filler ideas for the boxes. And I'm not entirely sure, were these handed out last week? They're at the door. So we have, we have the leaflet uh, about the shoe box appeal at the door, along with the filler ideas, um, which you can help yourself to. Of course, these will be now on the screens for the next few weeks, I suspect. Um, let me just read to you. Um, uh, an item, that, an email that Judith sent uh, Douglas last night. So shoeboxes and items for them can be handed in any Sunday up to the 27th of October. They can also be dropped off at the hall on Wednesday the 23rd of October between 2 and 3 p.m. or on the packing and checking days which are Monday the 28th and Tuesday the 29th of October between 2 and 5 o'clock. Anyone able to help with the packing and checking, please speak to Judith. Uh, and cash donations will also be gratefully uh, received. You know, this is something we do uh, every year, and it's a great privilege to be able uh, to help in, a, in just a very small way. But you see with the reaction of those who receive these humble gifts of what it means to some folks who possibly feel forgotten, that there they are in their abject poverty, many of them now living and have been living for a number of years in a war zone. And what a, what a blessing it is to receive a gift from folks in Scotland and, and elsewhere. Jeremy, who was speaking in the video there, it was Jeremy's father, I know Jeremy, Jeremy's father who uh, started um, Blytheswood Care. And it's really become a, a substantial uh, organization that does a great deal of good work uh, particularly in Europe, in Eastern Europe, but also elsewhere. And I'm particularly encouraged by the fact that they don't simply send the gifts, the material things, but also send them the word of blessing, the word of love, the word of hope, the word of faith, 
in the gospel, um, which accompanies each and every gift. Today, our theme, we're going to be considering um, God's moral law, his golden rules, not really looking at the rules, but the reasons why we should keep them. In other words, we're going to be considering the preface to the Ten Commandments. And there we're reminded what they show us, in effect, is that we are not only to love God, but that we're to love our neighbor. And remember how Jesus taught, what Jesus taught, because there were some in his day who thought that their neighbors were only those who looked like them and acted like them and believed identical things to them. And Jesus gave them a number of examples. He taught them the parable of the Good Samaritan in particular and taught us that our neighbor is our fellow image bearers, our fellow human beings uh, throughout the world, irrespective of class or creed or color or whatever. And so it's a good thing that we, we can do these, uh, that we can give a little to help much those in different parts of the world and particularly in relation to this in Eastern Europe. I think that's all that we want to say. We're going to, we're going to sing to God's praise once again. It's the new commandment, but the new commandment's an old commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. John's going to read to us from the Old Testament scriptures. Our reading this morning is taken from the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to thousands, generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. 
You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Amen. Thank you. We're going to sing once again a well-known hymn, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling.
Well, we turn back to the portion of Scripture that John read to us a few moments ago, and we're going to focus upon primarily verses 1 and 2, these words. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Last week, I spoke to you via a recording about pastoral priorities. And this Sunday, I want to continue with a theme, or on the theme of priorities, by drawing your attention to what the Word of God has to teach us about moral priorities, and particularly the moral priorities of God's people. I do so by reference to the moral law encapsulated in the Ten Commandments, and specifically here in these first two verses in Exodus 20 that act as a prologue to the said commandments. It's probably safe to surmise that a generation or two ago, most professing Christians and even most probably citizens of our nation would have known the Ten Commandments well enough to rehearse them if asked. The commandments were taught in the church and also throughout the school system. Today, without exaggeration, I think it's fair to say that most people would struggle to name them, and that includes many churchgoers. And not surprisingly, church and nation are the poorer and the worse for it. Neglectful of God's word and his commandments, we have lost our way in a labyrinth of moral relativism and confusion and even chaos. Consequently, we inflict much needless pain and misery and mayhem upon ourselves and others. There is much talk of love in our contemporary world, but it's not the love of God. It's not the love that is defined for us in the sacred scriptures. Rather, love today is often taken for license or self-centeredness, which is really the antithesis of biblical love. True love, the Bible makes clear, demands self-sacrifice. You see, it is centrifugal rather than centripetal. It is a giving love rather than a getting one, although in giving we receive so much more in return. For many, to love has come to mean the affirmation and acceptance of all manner of aberrant beliefs and behaviors, but that is not the love that God has called us to mirror back to him and to show and exhibit to our neighbor. By contrast, God's moral law shows us what it truly means to love God and love our neighbor. His gospel, in the first instance, bids us come to Jesus as we are, with all our sins and needs and weaknesses, we come to him in faith and repentance that he might transform us for good, that he might change us by his grace so that we might keep his law of love. God is not a killjoy, as many people appear to think. He wants us to live and prosper. He wants us to live meaningful and purposeful and profitable and contented and, yes, joyous lives now and always. 
You see, God loves us and he cares for us. And he understands that when we go our own way, when we forsake him and give free expression to the fallen nature, we tend to hurt and harm ourselves and others. We ignore his word and his blueprint for prospering in our world, in creating and cultivating an environment where love for harmony, peace and happiness, righteousness can truly flourish. Why is our world in the way it is? Why do we see so much violence and hatred and greed and corruption and hedonism, sadomasochism, and the like? Something has gone sorely amiss. And the Bible explains just what that is. And it shows us the remedy for it in God the Lord. Therefore, let us consider the preface to the moral law or the Ten Commandments. God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It's not only that they were enslaved by the Egyptians in a literal fashion, but it's a picture of humanity enslaved to the fallen nature. The moral law, let us note, begins with God. God has spoken. The God who created us. The God who gives us life and sustains that life. The God who loves us. The God who is our lawgiver. The God who is our redeemer. The God who is our benefactor has spoken. He has taken the initiative to show forth a more excellent way through his people to the world to be a beacon to hope and harmony. It is God who determines right from wrong, good from evil, etc. He defines these things for us. God instructs us. God illuminates them for us through his spirit. The moral law, you see, which was originally written upon our hearts at the heart of man and woman at creation reflects something of the image or the likeness of God, the character of God, because our God is love. And we see that manifest in the Father's awesome and unfathomable love for us. While we were yet enemies, we're told, he sent his son into the world to live the perfect life and die the death and rise again that we might have light and life and love, that we might truly begin to live not for ourselves but for, for him and one and others as God originally intended. We see it perfectly manifest in the person and work of Jesus who came not to abolish the law but rather to fulfill the law and then offer himself unto God as the perfect oblation for our sin. For God the Father made him to be sin who knew no sin so that you and I might become the righteousness of God. We see it perfectly in Jesus Christ who is love personified we perceive it aright through the enlightenment and the gift of the Holy Spirit who indwells God's people. The preface here beckons us hence to hear and heed the word of the living God. If only we would hear and heed him. What a different world we would live in. There would not be the same appeals week by week. The same people living on the street in abject misery and poverty of young people walking around with machetes of violence and hatred and warfare on massive scale. If only we would love God and love our neighbor. The law is God given. It's the great I am, the Lord our God who has spoken. Thus says the Lord. The preface bids us receive 
God's amazing grace to live in love, to come to him, to follow him. We're not saved. We're not put into a right relationship by keeping the law, but rather we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ in order that we might keep God's law of love, learning to walk with him, learning again to be his image bearers as beloved children walking before him in love, as he says. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Hence the preface to the Ten Commandments here. There's the right order. The grace proceeds the doing of the law. God rescued his people graciously, lovingly. He went to their aid. He took them out of the house of bondage and slavery. And that's always the right order. We don't think to ourselves, oh, well, make our, I'll make myself better and well, and then I'll present myself to God. No, we come. Like the prodigal, we come in our filthy rags. We come with all our needs and problems. And we lay them upon the Lord. That he would put on us that special robe. And again, put the ring on our finger and put shoes on our feet and so on. That we might all rejoice. So there is the rescue which precedes the renewal. And then the right living. That's the rightful order. God not only declares us righteous in Christ, but God makes us righteous in Christ. Let us therefore acknowledge the person who has given us the moral law. We come to worship him. God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. God reveals himself and his will for his people, for all people. And God is love. He wills our best, our good. He is holy, he is righteous, he is just. And he wants to see a world where justice prevails. God calls us into a relationship with himself and one another that is rooted and built up in love. Love is the soil, in other words, in which we are planted in order that we might grow up and bear much fruit. And it's important that we keep seeing this and saying this because that's the summation of the law, love. God has rescued and redeemed us for love's sake, for this very purpose, for this reason. Let us recognize the principle, hence, underlying the moral law. God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It's the moral law in summary form, the Ten Commandments. These ten words are ten golden rules. Its directives are God-given. But it's a discipline for our growth, just as we set parameters in our houses when our children were little, because we love them and we care for them and we don't want them to harm themselves. So God the Lord, our loving Heavenly Father, does likewise for us, for he knows what we're capable of left to our own devices. That's the reality of it. He's designed these things for our spiritual as well as our social good. In other words, his prohibitions bear positive results. The moral law cultivates an environment where we can all flourish and where the fruits of faith can truly abide and abound. It is the way of love. As Jesus said when he was questioned, he pointed to the two tablets. Remember how God wrote his commandments on, with the finger of God. They were written on two tablets of stone given to Moses. 
And when Jesus is asked, which is the greatest commandment, he points to the first table of the law. And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. That's what we're to do. Love, you see, is faith and hope and action. That's the call. That love, hence, is centripetal. It's outward looking towards God and towards my neighbor, towards the other. It's a giving of self, and yet we receive as we give. But sadly, something, we turn in on ourselves. The great Augustine of Hippo once helpfully defined sin, which tellingly has I, S-I-N, I at its rotten core. He described sin as being curved in on oneself, like crooked twigs or trees, bent inwards. Remember the words of the servant, you shall be as gods. It makes us inward looking, egotistical, narcissistic, proud, Rather than looking up to God in faith and looking outwards to others in love, sin makes us self-centered and selfish. And tragically, we end up misusing and abusing God's good gifts as weapons in our rebellion against him and each other. And hence the fallen world we inhabit. However, God has shown us, as the apostle says, a more excellent way, a better way, a way way whereby we can once again offer hope and be fruitful, where humanity can flourish. And it's not as a means of life, but it's a way of life for God's beloved children. The moral law is light in a dark world directing people to God, showing us our need because we all fall short of the glory of God. That's why it's for none of us to judge others. We shouldn't be noting the speck in another's eye when I've got a plank in my own. God is our judge. But this word directs us to God in Jesus. And hereby the church is called to be a witness to others of how to live in fellowship and friendship with God and one another for our mutual benefit and blessing. And oh, how so often we have failed in that objective. And that's why we constantly need to come back to God for grace, for forgiveness, for renewal. Let us understand the precepts, hence, of the that comprise the moral law. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. We recognize the importance, firstly, of the moral law, the Ten Commandments given by God to Moses and his people on these two tablets. The first four, or should that be three? You know, I, I discuss these things with Catholic friends. They have, they have three and seven. They have the same Ten Commandments. We all agree what the Ten Commandments are. But they have three and seven. We have four and six. So they would take the first two as one commandment. And then so, whereas we have four for the first. And then seven, they divide because it's a different word that's used in two places for covet. In our English Bibles, translated covet, are two different words used. And so they divide that. So they have three and seven. And I'm not entirely sure they're wrong. Why do I say that? Because three is the number for God in the Bible. You shall love the Lord your God is the greatest commandment. The seven is, speaks of perfection, of maturity of man's and woman's spiritual maturity before God, the fulfillment, that's the call. So I don't know, but it's the same commandments. And they teach us how to love the Lord our God. They re- we ought to reflect upon the moral law regularly. The psalmist says, 
that the blessed person, the blessed man, as Psalm 1 says, delights in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, in all he does he prospers. Let us make use of the moral law as a golden rule for the glory of our God and for our mutual good. Let us worship God only and banish all idols, things that we put in his stead, things that we put before him. Let us never abuse or misuse God's name. Let us seek and savor God regularly, making use of the means of grace, including this day, the Lord's day, when we gather together. Let us honor the family and God's, God's ordering of it. Let us recognize and give respect to those in authority under God. Let us not murder and commit adultery and steal and defame and covet anything that belongs to our neighbor. In other words, let us eschew, because it goes beyond the actual doing to the very thought that leads to them. Let us eschew pride and hatred and lust and greed and envy and resentment and bitterness and jealousy and all these things. Let us rather ask for the old paths and walk therein. These are the ways, you see of peace and pleasantness. Finally, let us embrace the purpose of God's moral law. The moral law, you see, is given to make us holy. You shall be holy as the Lord, as I, the Lord your God, am holy. And that means loving. The moral law is given to make us honorable, that we might be known as men and women of sincerity, of integrity, of decency, that are fundamentally good and are seeking the good of others, not seeking to exploit others for our personal advantage. The moral law is given. We must never forget to make us happy. You see, that's one of the great count. That's one of the, uh, the lures, I suppose, that the, that evil spirit would have us believe to the contrary, that God is somehow or other withholding from us. And this is the right way. This is what's going to make us happy. And there are things that hook us and make us miserable. Lead us into the mire, like the prodigal. Oh, if only I had all my money, I'm going to leave. Get away from the father's house under his watchful gaze. And what does he do? He spent everything. He gave himself to a hedonistic lifestyle, thinking this is the way. We would say today, or my generation, I, I don't suppose the current generation would have said it, but my generation would have said, think, thinking back, you know, was it wine, women, and song or something like that? You get the point. It's when we abuse these things. There's nothing wrong with the things in and of themselves. It's when we abuse them and we get hooked up on that which ultimately leads us to harming ourselves and to harming others. No, God has given us his law to make us happy and to work for the happiness of others as well as his glory. Well, may the Lord himself add his blessings to these few thoughts this day. Amen. I'm not entirely sure who's Alison's going to lead us in prayer. <coughs> have my prayer. But just before I read uh, the words and thoughts from myself, um, our seed sowers have been looking in the last uh, few weeks about the parable of the sower. So I'm just thinking of where seeds land um, and say a few things. So um, when, when I read my, word, my words, the you know, I haven't just sat and scribbled them out or typed them out. I've taken some time over it. But I actually find it very useful because the prayer, which is such a fundamental part of, of our worship and our life, um, might are chaotic. You know, I, uh, I often think, 
I didn't, I didn't mean to go off at that sort of tangent and I lose the thread of what I'm saying. So, so being part of the prayer rota makes me sit and focus and I find it quite satisfying at the end of it. So what I'm saying is I'm throwing some seeds at you. I'll not hound you, but if you give it some thought and I might approach you or you can approach me, but please don't avoid me. Um, if you think you could join the prayer rota, it's a great team we've got just now, but we're not, it's not a big team. And the more people that were on it, the, the onus of putting it all together would, um, would uh, dissolve somewhat. Anyway, I've thrown the seeds. Let us pray. Our Father, we meet this beautiful morning aware that the sun is shining lower on the horizon, but still warming the shortening autumn days. The gardens and the woodlands are ablaze with colour, and the fields of golden crops ready for harvesting, or stubble where it is already gathered in. And we give thanks for your bounty to us, and for the labour of the farmers who have tended their fields and produced food for our tables. Hear our words of thanks for this gift, Lord, and our sorrow and concern in our awareness that elsewhere in this country and throughout the world, crops are failing due to floods or droughts. Father, hear our words of concern and sorrow for our environmental degradation of this world. We know there have always been episodes of severe weather throughout the world, throughout time, but it appears deadly droughts are lasting longer over increasing areas of parched land. Hurricanes are increasing in strength and devastation. Floods and landslips are resulting from prolonged periods of torrential rain. Strengthen our resolve and actions to play our part in reducing polluting injury of our world. Strengthen the resolve and actions of agencies and governments which can make and change policies and activi activities and turn around from the destructive path the rich and developed nations are making for the planet. Lord, we pray for our community. We pray for our children and young people. Help their families and our society provide love, support and guidance as they grow. Bless the children who come along to the seed sowers and the team who greet them and lead them each Wednesday afternoon. We pray that all will enjoy the autumn holiday and return ready for another season of fun and learning. We pray for our families, our friends and neighbours who are facing the challenges life can bring. Let us all remember that we can bring worries and concerns to you in our prayers. We pray for our families, friends and neighbours who are living with illness, for those who are nearing the end of their days on earth, and for those who are mourning. Let them feel the comfort of knowing you are with them through your peace and through the actions of those who care about them. And today, Lord, we bring our broken world and lay it in sorrow at your feet. We pray in particular for the situation in the Middle East. We pray for those whose experiences of life have taught them hatred, whose pain nourishes rage, whose dreams are violent, whose religion divides. We pray for your people who face suspicion as they reach out across the lines, who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Help them sustain their witness to your wisdom to hear your word, which goes out to one and all. To hear that the force of hatred of others be checked within us. To hear that the impulse to demonize others be checked within us. To hear that the rush to violence against others be checked within us. We pray for those who have been bereaved by this war's violence of bombardment, occupation and resistance who are in need of your presence and comfort, your healing in mind and body and soul. We pray for the release of all Israeli hostages and Palestinian prisoners, that they might return to their families and friends. 
We pray for medical and humanitarian aid to reach safely those in desperate need of it. God of peace, in your wisdom, give us the will to seek peace. God of peace, in your wisdom, give the leaders in all sides of the conflict occurring and escalating in the Middle East the will to seek peace. God of peace and of healing, fill every heart with your peace. Hear these words which come from the heart and through the teachings and love of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Just before our last um, singing hymn, um, on the theme of um, prayer, beginning next month, won't be next week, I was going to mention it, but since Alison's uh, made a plug for prayer, um, we're going to begin um, when, the, when the choir are not singing on those Sundays. I'm going to invite those of you who wish to join me from 10.30 to 10 to 11 at the front here for just for prayer for the service and for, you know, for various things. We'll have a short time of prayer. It may be that you maybe just want to read a few verses of the Bible and, or share a psalm or something, but we're going to do that on those Sundays when the choir is not, play, uh, is not t- participating in the actual service from 10.30 till 10 to 11. So time, just a short time of prayer. Just to encourage folks and to encourage the congregation and ask the Lord's blessing upon all that we do and say. Well, let us worship God. Now, this hymn, I, I, you, I, you, I love this. I utilized this. I made use of it during the COVID pandemic and when we were not here. I don't think we've sang it. So you were thinking, oh, it's the last hymn. It should be something. It's easy to pick up. You, you, you'll get it. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely positive. It's a beautiful, beautiful song. You'll really enjoy it, but also be uplifted and singing along to it. Yet not I, but Christ through me. I think it's the same folk who wrote this who did Jesus Strong and Kind, uh, which, we've, which we've come to love. So... i 
let us conclude. And now as we leave this place of worship, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with each one of you now and forevermore. Amen. Tea and coffee will be served in the church hall. Um, there's a large crowd clearly didn't recognize the time of the service this morning and are just arriving, so uh, take care leaving.